Yeah, bonjour, bienvenue. Uh, welcome everyone to today's uh, weekly research conference here at the University of Ottawa Hart Institute and uh, for our community here and uh, partners. And uh, so before I introduce our uh, guest uh, speaker today, Dr. Robert Evram, uh, I just uh, want to cover some of the logistics. And uh, so um, uh, on your platform, uh, if you have questions, uh, please post them as the lecture goes along and using the Q&A feature on the bottom uh, of your screen. And this will be answered at the end of the presentation. And we'll be also accepting live questions at the end of the presentation. So you can use your hands up feature on the bottom and then you'll be unmuted by the uh, moderator and you can pose your question directly. And, uh, but on the other hand, if you have any technical challenges, uh, please use the chat feature uh, on the bottom of your screen and uh, Kelsey or Allison or our team will help you to get you joined in properly. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, today, we in fact have a reprise of a fantastic lecture given by Dr. Robert Abram uh, earlier uh, for the cardiology rounds, but this today is actually for our research community. And uh, many of you know already Dr. Robert Avram uh, is an international, uh, is a internationally renowned uh, AI expert. And we're very fortunate to have him here as an interventional fellow uh, at the Heart Institute. He completed his uh, internal medicine and cardiology training at the University of uh, Montreal before pursuing a three-year postdoctoral fellowship in artificial intelligence in medicine and interventional cardiology at the University of California, San Francisco, uh, which is of course, you know, uh, one of the key hubs of uh, AI in medicine. At the UCSF, he developed and implemented and tested various digital tools applicable to medicine and cardiology, including wearables, biosensors, smartphone uh, apps. He has conducted two large scale prospective mobile health studies. Uh, in fact, I had the pleasure of meeting Robert at one of the uh, Canadian Cardiovascular Congress meeting, I think it was back in 2019 in Montreal. And uh, it was together with uh, Abhinav Sharma at the McGill University, you know, who we have uh, ongoing collaboration. And uh, Robert at that time during our conversation was able to demonstrate to me on his cell phone that uh, in fact, he can show me his beat to beat ECG recording along with his electrolyte values. I say, I want this for my heart failure patient now. So we kept in touch with uh, Robert and uh, uh, looking forward to future collaborations. So imagine my delight when I found out that uh, actually Robert is coming to the Heart uh, Institute to complete uh, interventional cardiology fellowship before his returning to uh, Montreal Heart Institute on faculty uh, in the area of uh, uh, AI and interventional cardiology. Indeed, for advancing AI-based uh, uh, research in cardiology, he taught himself programming in machine learning and deep learning algorithms to analyze medical data. In fact, uh, he's already published a number of leading edge articles on big data and uh, AI medicine, include papers on population heart rate distribution, in variables in, in MPG digital medicine, and more recently, identification of novel digital signatures to detect early diabetes from plasmography data available from wearables published in Nature Medicine. And meanwhile, Dr. Abrams already taking advantage of data available here at the Heart Institute to answer key questions, for example, in prognosis and risk stratification. So we really look forward to his uh, lecture today entitled Applications of Artificial Intelligence in Cardiology. Thank you so much, Robert, for being able to share this with us today. Thank you, Dr. Liu, for the introductions and the very kind words. I'm honored to be here and to be presenting in front of such a distinguished crowd. So we'll be diving into the depths of applications of artificial intelligence in cardiology. And I'm super excited to speak to you about this topic, which I'm really passionate about. Before we begin, I just wanted to share my disclosures. There is nothing major, but I do have some research funding and some consulting fees as well. My presentation today is separated in five uh, different parts. First, I want to convince you that you should pay attention to AI in medicine. Then I want to really describe what is artificial intelligence because there are some misconceptions. Then I will dive deep into 
excited about the future. And, and similar in medicine, I think a future where AI can automate a lot of the routine tasks we perform daily as a physician, such as reading te uh, tests uh, or you know, uh, responding to commonly asked patient qu qu questions could make medicine more humane and patient-centric by allowing physicians to care for patients rather than interpret clinical tests. Um, the other really exciting aspect of AI, as it will attempt to demonstrate, is to leverage pre-existing data to unleash a whole new array of applications that were previously impossible to achieve. So I want to show you this chart. This is the chart of a computational power um, since the 1960s. And you can see until 2012, you had a linear increase and the computer power was doubling every two years, that was Moore's law. And then since 2012, basically we have graphical processing units and different ways of uh, designing processors. So the computational power has doubled every 3.4 months. This is really important to understand because before, in order to train AI models, you needed millions of dollars of computer infrastructure and it wasn't commonly available. The technology has been there, or at least the mathematical models were there for AI 60 years ago, but the computational power was not there. Uh, and now it, uh, training AI models is much cheaper than before. Furthermore, we are generating an abundant quantity of digital data. So Ottawa it was really lucky to be the first in Canada to implement EPIC as end-to-end -end -end medical record. EPIC is a fantastic tool for data collection. Everything is digital and it's a perfect tool to generate data for AI algorithms. And this is a chart showing the EMR adoption in the US and it's nearly ubiquitous now. And I think at least in, in family or outpatient practices, everyone is using an EMR in Ontario. It's maybe less prevalent in hospital medicine. And now why AI in medicine? Well, medicine is becoming more complex. And furthermore, it's really hard to digest all of the data and all of the evidence and face the workload of modern medicine. I see many of my colleagues, you know, answering uh, a lot of messages on Epic, interpreting test results, doing follow-up. So a lot of that data could already be digested or flagged by AI. So uh, in order to reduce the burden on medical care to physicians and healthcare professionals. Also, data interpretation needs standardization. That means that when you look at the same transthoracic echocardiogram, sometimes two echocardiographers might come with very different interpretations, which might lead to different patient care. We also need to move away from one size fits all. And right now we have one size fits all risk scores, which we apply to the whole population. And we need to move towards personalized medicine and AI and machine learning will allow that. And I think that artificial intelligence will allow for more efficient, streamlined and standardized uh, patient care tailored to the patient and ultimately will make medicine more humane. I also think that physicians must take an active role in shaping how AI is developed and used in practice and research, uh, because otherwise th this will belong to um, uh, you know, tech companies and they might implement in a very different way that's not patient or clinical practice friendly. I wanna also share with you this chart of the number of publication of AI and machine learning. And basically you can follow the increase in the computational power and compare it to the amount of papers. And you can see it's like, it has a very strong correlation, but we had an exponential growth in interest around AI and machine learning studies in cardiology. And you can see to the right, um, a confusion matrix that shows, uh, or a heat map that shows what modalities are analyzed for AI and what pathologies. And uh, I wanna draw your attention that there is almost nothing in interventional cardiology and it mainly focuses on ECGs, CTs, EHR data, or ultrasound results. Now, I wanna draw this comparison between conventional research and AI research, just so you can better frame exactly what is AI, but conventional research requires patients and regular visits with nursing coordinators in order to generate data. And the data could be sometimes patient reported, but in general, it's collected during a visit. And then the data is analyzed using frequentist or Bayesian statistics, which are the conventional ways of performing research and deriving evidence. AI research is big data. So really, really any data generated by patients can be used for AI research. I'm talking you know, lab results, encounter notes, but also text messages that patients might send or locations or images from patients. So any rich data set can be used. And ideally we need high volume, meaning a lot of data points or rich data, such as medical notes or images, which by themselves represent you know, millions of data points. 
then instead of relying on a nursing coordinator, you rely on a data engineer to extract the data. Then this data goes to a data scientist in order to format and analyze the data. And ideally, we're talking at least 10,000 data points. But I, I got to say the top AI models have trillions of uh, per parameters or features. Uh, and those are taught, like, can, for example, can translate any language into any language. So those require trillions of data points. And conventional research is analyzed using frequentist statistics, which assumes a predefined relationship between variables. Uh, so for example, linear or logarithmic um, relationship between dependent and independent variables. But because it's a predefined relationship, it usually requires much less data such as at least 30 data points in order to derive some inference. So in this example, if I wanna create a logistic regression model that will predict a STEMI from an ECG, I will take the feature, which is the ST segment elevation. I will have different values of ST segment elevation. I might find that one millimeter is the optimal cutoff. Then I'm gonna assume a logistic uh, relationship between the ST segment elevation, the STEMI diagnosis. And then I'm gonna have a model that's going to classify an ECG signal or actually the SD segment into a STEMI or not a STEMI. That's the conventional way for doing research. AI research will automatically, the algorithm will automatically learn the relationship between the data and the outcome without the predefined relationship. So in frequentist statistics, you assume a linear log a logarithmic uh, relationship. Here you have a multi-dimensional a polynomial relationship as well. It usually requires large amounts of data, like I said, and the AI algorithm will learn by seeing a ton of examples of STEMI or diagnosis different from a STEMI and will figure out exactly what is important in the ACG signal to identify a STEMI and differentiate it from not a STEMI. This is an excellent article that was published in New England Journal of Medicine two years ago that, by one of my San Francisco peers that walks you through the steps of deriving your own AI model. But I just want to, you know, just closely go over those so you can better conceptualize it. But it starts with defining a task and tasks are usually either to generate data such as translate a text into another, classify data such as classify an ECG signal into a STEMI and not a STEMI, or predict or do regression or predict a continuous value such as predicting a house price, for example, from a picture of a house. And the data is usually in a raw input normally, so it can be read by humans, but you have to convert it. You can see here with my mouse into a format that a computer will understand. It usually involves a series of zeros or ones or numbers. Computers don't understand letters. And then you must feed a ton of examples from your training data set to train your machine learning model. And the machine learning or AI model will iterate consecutively to all the examples and will figure out what is the best way to differentiate one category from the other. And then you have a separate data set, usually called the test data set, which was not used during the training of the model, which is then used to assess the performance of the machine learning model by comparing predictions from the model with the actual ground truth label annotator. AI in general is just data flowing through code and performing mathematical operations. It's a very advanced statistical system that has been described, like I said, 60 years ago. So it's just a, a matter of having the right data and the right algorithm to express that data. Now, let's talk about applications of AI in cardiology. Uh, there's different layers or depths that you can dive into um, of ap applying AI in cardiology. First of all, the most frequently known is to perform well-defined tasks that physicians currently perform. For example, can you have an AI read an ECG or an ultrasound of the heart, a transthoracic echocardiogram. But most importantly, this can be used to decentralize healthcare by providing underserved communities with access to specialized healthcare. So for example, you could build an AI algorithm that would detect the diabetic retinopathy automatically without the need of ophthalmologists. Then you can implement that model in peripheral hospitals or clinics that don't have ophthalmologists. So this, in this way, you don't need to, you don't replace the doctor necessarily, you just decentralize access to specialized healthcare. Also, AI can then be used to combine different data sources together to derive superior inference from it than from a single data source. So you can combine all the images that the patient has done with labs with encounter notes to improve risk prediction. Another really interesting aspect of AI in cardiology or in medicine is to develop novel tools using pre-existing signals. So there's been examples of predicting ejection fraction using an ECG signal alone, and that's a task that physicians are not readily 
able to do, but AI can do very well. And finally, sometimes you might read the term journal AI. Journal AI is an AI that is able to do many different tasks, tasks that it was not trained to do. And that's, that belongs to the realm of science fiction. There is no path towards general AI. Current AI represents a narrow AI that is good at a single task or multiple tasks that it was trained to do. And like I said, it's the same uh, mathematical models that was described 60 years ago. And there's no current path towards general AI. It doesn't require more data to perform general AI. You might need you know, new approaches to data analysis in general. AI in medicine requires a couple of steps before it gets translated into clinical practice. First, you need to generate data. And we are already doing that with EPIC and uh, all our uh, laboratory results or imaging are digital. So we have achieved that already. Then you need to access the data and train an AI algorithm in-house. So we're working on that and I'll share with you some projects. Then you validate the algorithm internally on a test data set then you must evaluate the algorithm on an external data set because it's not good enough to have an AM algorithm that performs well within your institution. You must also show it generalizes to different uh, data sets or different institutions as well in order for it to actually change clinical practice. Then you need to think, how are you gonna apply AI in the clinical practice workflow? How does a physician interact with AI? Where exactly does it come in the, the clinical workflow. And this is still a debate for research currently, and I'll show you some examples as well. And finally, we essentially need to demonstrate that it has a positive impact on outcomes. Otherwise, we would not rely on AI in the first place. So I would say step one through five has already been accomplished in a series of tasks and algorithms, sometimes in cardiology or sometimes in neurology or other fields of interest, but the impact on outcomes is currently not, there's no robust trials that have assessed in, like clinical impact of AI algorithms yet, save for maybe one or two studies in neurology for stroke detection. Now I'll share with you a couple of examples today and all of my examples today will use the same presentation of the results. So as a brief refresher, I'm sure most of you are familiar with this, but this is the receiver operand curve and we measure the area under the curve to define the performance of a classifier. And you can see basically on the Y axis, uh, it's the true positive rate, uh, also known as uh, sensitivity. And on the X axis is the false positive rate, also known as one minus specificity. And then you can plot this curve at different uh, values of sensitivity and specificity. And in general, an area under the curve of 0.5 represents uh, like represents a model that's not better than chance alone. It's like tossing a coin. But as you move away from that, and you see 0 0.6, 0 0.7, or 0.8 represents an AI model that's better able to identify uh, true positive examples from true negative examples. And one is a perfect classifier, meaning it makes absolutely no mistake, has 100% sensitivity and specificity. I will also show you confusion matrices and confusion matrices are this, uh, displayed here as a cartoon to the upper right and lower right as well. So it basically represents the graphical um, display of true positive, true negative, false positive, false negative. So it allows you to see where the AI model is making mistakes. So all of my examples today will show you confusion matrices and ROC curves. So I'm very excited today to you to share uh, with you uh, the final results of CAPAI, which is a fully automated coronary and geography interpretation and stenosis detection using a deep learning based algorithmic pipeline. This project started three years ago uh, in San Francisco and we recently validated in, at Ottawa Heart Institute. So as you're aware, coronary heart disease is the number one cause of death in the US and second cause of death in Canada. We perform coronary and geography as one of the most frequent tests um, on, on our cardiology patient because it is the gold standard for both diagnosing and treating coronary artery disease. However, despite the fact that this technology has existed for decades, we still rely in most cases on visual assessment of stenosis uh, as the de facto method for assessing the severity of the stenosis. Yes, we have physiological tools and imaging, but those are not used as frequently as visual assessment. And the issue with visual assessment is that this measurement suffers from very high inter-observer and in intra-observer variability, meaning that the same cardiologist might, might look at the same images and come up with different stenosis narrowings and different management for the same patient, leading to potentially inappropriate treatment or over-treatment and potentially poorer outcomes. So we ask ourselves the question, 
can we develop an AI algorithm that will perform all tasks necessary to automatically read a coronary angiogram and also more specifically localize stenosis and predict their severity. To do so, we extracted the data of the coronary angiograms and their reports from 13,000 patients over the last decade uh, done in San Francisco at the UCSF. We trained four separate AI algorithms in an end-to-end -end matter uh, to perform all the necessary tasks uh, required for automatic coronary angiography reading. And then we validated it in San Francisco and also in about 500 coronary angiograms performed consecutively at Ottawa Heart Institute. The cath AI algorithm is outlined here. Algorithm one detects the view under which the eye arm is looking at. Uh, and you can see, for example, here AP cranial. And then algorithm two will detect the underlying main anatomical structure in the frame. Uh, because we perform in geographies of radial arteries or femoral arteries or aortas, it was really important for us to focus only on left and right coronary arteries. Then algorithm three defines the anatomy. You can see in pink here, the prox LED, and then you have in yellow, the mid uh, left interior descending artery. And then in red here, there is a bounding box that is created around an area of stenosis. And then algorithm four will take this image as input and will predict the stenosis percentage. You can see cath AI working in real time in the lower left corner. Um, the boxes represent different uh, segments of the artery vessel. And in yellow, you can see the stenosis. And then you can see here the frames that are selected that have a stenosis identified. And then we predict the percentage, in this case, 46.9%. We have the results here of algorithm one. This is a confusion matrix. In short, you want to have all of the uh, classes predicted on the x-axis match the classes that are labeled on the y-axis. So you want them on this diagonal. Any result diverging from this diagonal represents an error that the model has uh, performed. And you can see that most of, there is a concentration of predictions on the diagonal. And overall we had 90% sensitivity and specificity on 200,000 images. Then we also train algorithm two to identify left and right coronary arteries and differentiate them from other anatomical structures such as grafts or uh, aorta. And here we had over 90% sensitivity and specificity. We often hear that AI is a black box, but in this case, we developed uh, attention mechanisms that will tell us what area of the image is used for the prediction. So in this case, you have a left coronary artery demonstrating two different views, and you can see that the AI is mainly looking at the coronary and not uh, um, accessory structures like the myocardium or the catheter to de determine that this is a left coronary artery. You can also see here the pixels that are using the predictions. Similarly, this is a different anatomical structure. This is not a left corner, it's the aorta. And you can see that the algorithm is mainly using parts of the aorta to determine this as the aorta. This is really important to assess because sometimes AI algorithms make mistakes by using parts that are not intuitive or not used by humans to predict those, to make those predictions. Here you can see the prediction of algorithm four. Um, and we achieved an uh, area under the curve in blue of 86.2. To do this, we average the predictions across single frames of a stenosis in a certain video. And then we average predictions uh, within a stenosis scene across multiple views, similar to how an interventional cardiologist would perform this measurement. And overall, we had a sensitive and specificity greater than 75%, which um, has never, this type of work has never been reported or done before. Uh, we also looked at areas in the image that were used to predict the stenosis. Uh, and here you can see that it's predicting the stenosis percentage by highlighting parts of the vessel. In this case, you have a diffuse disease vessel, so it's using the whole vessel. In this case, you have a more focal stenosis in the second and third example. So it's using the most focal stenosis to predict the severity. We also perform external validation using two of our interventional cardiology fellows from Ottawa Heart Institute. To do so, we um, ask them to tell us what is the percentage stenosis in the bounding box for 464 coronary angiograms. Um, and then we compare the, their predictions of the stenosis with the AI stenosis prediction. And we have an agreement between the two adjudicators in 386 stenosis, so 83.1% of cases, but they did disagree in 78%. So uh, in, sorry, in 78 examples, so 16.8% of cases. This is important to illustrate the fact that there is a lot of inter-observer variability in the stenosis assessment. 
uh, agreement meant that they both agreed it was more over 70% narrowed. And this agreement meant that one said it was over 70%, the other said it was under 70%. The mean difference between the two adjudicators was uh, 16%. And between the AI stenosis and the average of the two adjudicators was 18% with a standard deviation of 11. You can also see to the right, the area under the receiving upper end curve. And we have achieved an area under the curve of 869 uh, in the 464 stenosis when compared to both adjudicators, which is comparable to our test data set and uh, basically confirms that our model is externally valid. So CAT-AI was able to automatically determine the projection, define a coronary anatomy, localized stenosis, and predict their level of severity with high sensitivity and specificity. It is an externally valid model as we have demonstrated our validation at Oro Heart Institute. And we think this work sets the foundation for a standardized stenosis measurement and eventually could lead the way to an automatic way of calculating the severity of CAD in a standardized fashion, such as a digital syntax core, which is a tool currently used by um, clinicians to send a patient to bypass graft versus PCI, percutaneous coronary intervention. I'm going to move next to a second application of AI in cardiology, which is our letter that was published in Nature Medicine last year about a digital biomarker for diabetes from smartphone-based vascular signals. As you're aware, diabetes affects over 693 million, will affect over 693 million people by 2045, and diagnosis is often delayed, leading to considerable morbidity and mortality because the microvascular complication and macrovascular complication can progress without treatment. Photoplasmography is a technique that is used to detect blood volume changes. And you can see here on the right, this is a smartphone application that shines the light on the pulp of the finger and basically allows us to determine waveforms reflecting the change in blood volume and the heart rate. This is frequently used in variables such as Fitbit or Apple Watch to measure the oxygen saturation or the heart rate. Our research question was, can we detect diabetes status using a photoplasmography signal obtained using a smartphone app and analyze using artificial intelligence? To do so, we leverage Healthy Heart, which is an observational international digital study where participants can join in and consent and donate their data, such as smartphone wear or wearable derived data, and also fill patient reported outcomes. We had 54, almost 54,000 participants that were invited and joined the study. Some had diabetes, some did not have diabetes, some had diabetes, uh, developed diabetes throughout the study period. They recorded a total of 2.6 million measurements of smartphone-based photoplasmography by downloading the app and taking a 30-second recording, which you see here. We then built an AI algorithm to detect diabetes status and differentiate it from the non-diabetic status. But the, Model outputs a score between zero and one. Uh, the more, the closer you want you are to one, the more likely you are to have diabetes. The closer you are to zero, the more the most likely you are to be non-diabetic. Here is again the familiar area under the receiving upper end curve, and we have here five curves. In blue, you have the performance of the diabetes score for a single twenty-second photoplasmography recording. We have a average AUC of 0 0.680, which is not really. Uh, state-of-the-art performance. We then average the predictions across multiple signals in an individual because a single signal might be artifactual or too short. And then we were able to increase the prediction to 0.76 um, for the diabetes score alone. We then built a logistic regression model for comparison that used age, body mass index, rates, gender, and comorbidities to predict diabetes. And we achieved this um, good performance of 784 AUC, which was comparable to our diabetes score alone. Then we asked ourselves, what happens if we combine both the logistic regression model with the diabetes score? And doing so, we obtained the red curve, which leads to an even superior performance of 0.830, which is comparable to other risk prediction scores for diabetes or some biomarker values of diabetes, such as fasting plasma glucose or glycated hemoglobin. We also validated the score in three cohorts. So we had a contemporary cohort, which had um, most more contemporary smartphones. And we showed that it works almost as, the, as well as in our test data set. And we also validated it in our clinic cohort, which is a cohort of patients that had lab conform, confirmed diabetes rather than just um, self-reported. We also found that the di digital diabetes score was a significant predictor of A1C with a very strong p-value of 0.01 and a fasting glucose in a linear um, 
in a linear um, regression model. We also highlighted parts of the signal that the AI was using to classify a photoplasmography signal as diabetic from non-diabetic. In red, you have diabetes signals. In green, you have non-diabetes signals. And you can see in red, uh, in, in pink, that areas such as the downslope, the absence of a dichrotic notch, uh, or our uh, variability are all features used by the model to identify a diabetic signal. Similarly, in non-diabetic signals, parts such as the downslope or the dichrotic notch or the peak that's more rounded uh, are also used to identify non-diabetic signals with strong probability. So our take home message is that we are describe a digital biomarker using AI for prevalent status of diabetes. This marker can be collected using any smartphone with a camera and photoplasmography. It is an independent predictor of diabetes in a logistic regression model and of A1C and fasting glucose. This is an example of applying AI to analyze signals that were before not analyzable by humans for this purpose. There is no work that was uh, demonstrated that has demonstrated PPG as the right signal for diabetes. So where do we take it from here? So I want to share with you this paper from N. Haynes, uh, three study in July 1997. For those that are less familiar, this is the paper that uh, derived the cutoffs of bio uh, of lab values for diagnosing diabetes. And the way they have done that is they obtain the prevalence of diabetic retinopathy at different thresholds of fasting plasma glucose or A1C. And they found, for example, that above 6.5 of A1C, there is a marked increase in the incidence of diabetic retinopathy. So we will take the same approach and we'll use the IPAC system, which is uh, FDA approved uh, without physician assistance of gr uh, re grading and diagnosing diabetic retinopathy. The patient just takes a photo with this camera system that can be installed in any clinic. This will tell us if a patient has diabetic retinopathy or not. Uh, we will screen 400 patients that are, don't have known diabetes. We'll also take prior biological results as well. And we'll obtain at the same time of the visit, the diabetes score based on our algorithm. You can see here a screenshot of the app that shows you exactly the score for a particular recording. And then our goal here is to add a row of the optical diabetes score, the deep neural network diabetes score that will hopefully show that with an increase in the score, there is also an increase in the instance of retinopathy and will allow us to define the, the cutoff for screening for diabetes using this technology. So we're currently in the process of recruiting patients for this study, and we hope to have results before the end of the year. Finally, I will share with you Kathy uh, F. So Kathy F is a project that we started uh, last year and is currently awaiting external validation. This is on the left, you can see a left ventricular ventral, ventriculography, which is associated with a 2.3 odd ratio of acute kidney injury. It's a test that's frequently performed at the end of the coronary angiogram to determine the ejection fraction, which represents the strength of the heart. We, however, uh, because it relates to injury to the kidneys, we ask ourselves the question, can we use coronary angiography to predict the left ventricular ejection fraction measured by a transthoracic echocardiogram, which is uh, one of the most routinely performed tests in cardiology within one week of the coronary angiogram. To do so, we took 3,404 patients, uh, in the last decade in San Francisco, we took 26,000 coronary angiogram videos and we matched them uh, with uh, the left ventricular ejection fraction as reported in the ultrasound, the transthoracic echocardiogram report. We had two categories, under 40% ejection fraction and greater or equal than 40%. Under 40% is abnormal, greater or equal than 40% is nearly normal or normal. And you can see here in blue, it's the video level. So for each coronary angiogram, uh, we have a strong capability to discriminate low ejection fraction for normal or borderline reduced ejection fraction with area on the curve of 0.853. And then when we average a prediction across multiple videos obtained during the same procedure within the same patient, we have an area under the curve of 913, which is excellent. We have here the sensitivity of about 75% and the specificity of 88%. That means that we're able to identify uh, LV dysfunction using a, a coronary angiogram alone routinely with high sensitivity and high specificity. This is an example of two separate angiograms. One has a normal ejection fraction and one does not have a normal ejection fraction. I'm not sure if the videos are gonna play well on your screen, but 
uh, try to guess, you know, which one has a low ejection fraction, which one does not. This is normally not a task that humans are accustomed to do, but you can see here that in the top one, we actually have a very low ejection fraction of 20% and the algorithm predicted a low EF with a probability of greater than 98%. And then the lower one, uh, we had a ejection fraction above 40% and the algorithm had a 2% chance of low ejection fraction, showing how our algorithm works. We're currently in the process of uh, externally validating it in uh, 500 angiograms performed at Ottawa Heart Institute, and we'll use a chart review as our comparator uh, based on ultrasounds that were performed near, near like seven days before or after a procedure. We also don't know what features are used in the prediction currently, and we have uh, two data scientists that are working to derive a model that will highlight parts of the video that are using this prediction. But this is the first time we're able to the, determine the ejection fraction of the myocardium with the left ventricle using coronary angiography alone. And we hope that ultimately this technology when put into the hands of clinicians will help reduce radiations and contrast exposure by limiting the use of LV ventriculography. Let's move now to the top myths and limitation of AI, which I think are really important to cover because there is a lot of hype in the field and uh, we just, there is limitations around this technology. So the first myth is, uh, AI will replace the physician. I think AI is a tool like any other. It's like saying logistic regression will replace the physician. I don't think that's true. I think ultimately it will allow physicians to be more patient centric and will take care of a lot of the routine tasks that uh, doctors do. I also think that doctors who use AI in their practice will be advantage over doctors who do not use AI. Um, the other myth is that AI is smart. So like I mentioned, AI is ec excellent at a narrow focus task but can only do a single task well. And it's the task that I was trained to do. So cat AI that's destined to read angiograms will not learn to read echocardiograms. Uh, the other myth is that AI is a black box. You don't understand the predictions. This was true 10 years ago, but now we have techniques that we can use to highlight which parts of the video or of the image are used in the prediction. And this can help reassure the clinician that it's using sensible information to make those predictions. And finally, People say that AI is going to make medical decision diagnosis. I think maybe down the line, but right now it definitely won't have the final word. Uh, you need oversight and responsibility by a physician and current AI approved algorithms by the FDOS or two or for stroke detection and they require physician overread. I also wanna draw your attention, always be aware of the validation. Most papers published in the AI field are the left-hand side. So it's the data set that was in the institution and they present the internal validation only. You must always validate the AI algorithm in an external data set. Otherwise you might suffer from biases in the data or the algorithm might not generalize at all. Also be aware of biases in the data. There's been a very famous dermatology paper that have shown a dermatology level identification of melanoma from pictures alone, but it only works in white color skin. It didn't work in black color skin. And that's a main issue because it, it could, AI could further contribute to the gaps in providing healthcare to the individuals and to the racial disparities in healthcare. So a model should always be validated in, you know, across genders and ethnicities and across socioeconomic status to make sure it performs reasonably well in all of those subgroups. Also, keep in mind, AI doesn't know what it doesn't know. So if I make a signal look like an ECG, even if it's not an ECG signal, AI could use that to predict an ECG diagnosis. It will not tell you it doesn't, the signal is not an ECG. So that's important to know because as long as the data format matches what the data format that AI was used to train or train on, it will do a prediction. It will not tell you its level of uncertainty. And that's a severe limitation. Also, I hear a lot of people really excited about AI and they wanna train AI on a small data sets. Right now, AI requires you know, 10,000 to millions of data points. So very rare disease cannot be successfully analyzed with AI. And finally, for AI to be successful, it has to be properly implemented in the clinical workflow. So I want to conclude by showing you future directions where we want to take artificial intelligence in medicine. First of all, at Ottawa Heart Institute, we have the largest STEMI volume in the province and one of the largest in the countries. And patients with uh, acute heart attack, also known as STEMI, vary markedly in terms of likelihood of bleeding and ischemic complications. Current bleeding and ischemic risk prediction score are of limited use clinically. And we know we have EMR such as EPIC that are now widely adopted 
and they offer promising opportunities to develop and validate new risk scores. And then we could apply those risk scores within the EMR. So at Ottawa Heart Institute, we want to, uh, we are designing a study where we will extract epic notes of patients greater than 18 years old who presented with a STEMI. We will apply an algorithm that will read the note and the lab results and will predict ischemic and bleeding outcomes at one year post STEMI. And then we hope in the future, deploy the risk score directly into EPIC to influence clinical decisions. This is an example of a note that was written by one of our fellows. And you can see here, we pre-screen it with a general AI that is able to identify key terminologies and classify terminologies in a note. This is important because that's the first step to derive features to predict bleeding risk. In this case, you know, heparin is a drug and it identifies successfully as a drug, so it understands the term. And then you can feed all of those highlighted terms into a model to predict our outcomes. I also want to show you other examples of how AI is implemented in clinical practice. One of the easiest way to distribute AI algorithms is via a smartphone app. So uh, iPhones or even all the Android devices, they currently have on-device machine learning or artificial intelligence chips, which are specially designed hardware used to uh, apply AI algorithms and make predictions on the spot on your device without using any internet connection. To the right, you can see an app called Pacemaker, and they deployed an AI model where you can take a screenshot with your smartphone camera of a chest x-ray. It will identify the pacemaker and then will tell you the probability of the uh, brand of the pacemaker. In this case, 96% that this is a Boston Scientific. So this app has already existed. It works. It's clearly being used by hundreds of thousands of people. There's also a lot of interest to integrate AI in pre-existing medical devices. So this is an example of the Philips App Store, which allow you to download apps on the latest generation Philips transthoracic echocardiogram machine to perform automatic tasks, such as determining the segmenting the left ventricle, determining the wall motion abnormalities, or determining the ejection fraction without any human input before you require human input. But right now you can just download an app that's basically an AI model that will run on the machine. There's also been a lot of work done to integrate models into the electronic medical record, like I mentioned for our work on STEMIs or on heart attacks. So Epic has an app store in the US called the Epic App Orchard. And basically you can download apps into your EMR. And some of those apps are AI models that read the EMR and provide the physician with a risk score on the spot while seeing a patient. So one of the most popular tools is the deterioration index. It's an index that is derived from encounter notes, labs, and vital signs that will tell you at a point in time how likely your patient is to deteriorate and might require ICU. And this has been greatly used to triage COVID patients. And you can see it draws this chart that shows you how it's trending over time and what exactly is it basing its prediction on. In this case, age and the respiratory rate and the neurological exam are all worrisome that this patient might deteriorate. So you might keep a close eye on it or prospectively admit him to the ICU. Finally, you can also deploy AI algorithms in your PAC system. This is an example from Arteries, which is a startup that is specialized in developing and implementing AI algorithms directly on the PACs, which is the radiology uh, exam viewer. And in here, this is the first FDA approved AI algorithm, which can scan a uh, CT scan for intracranial hemorrhages and large vessel occlusions within 20 seconds. And it is reimbursed by Medicare and Medicaid. Uh, physicians get paid $40, for example, to use this algorithm. And it's used to triage scans in high volume centers so that you do not delay the treatment that is usually life-saving. And it's hard to see, but there is a bounding box in red that shows a left um, um, middle cerebral vessel occlusion that's acute and might require intrathiotrombolysis. Now, I hear a lot of people tell me, like, how do I get started with AI? Here are, I took all my classes online. They're free or not expensive. Uh, DeepLearning.ai and Coursera are really key resources to get started. You need to take programming or linear algebra classes in order to get into AI, because AI is basically matrices operations uh, over large data sets, so you must understand both. Uh, and you need to find data or hire a data engineer and a data scientist to extract and transform the data. Then you should you know, run multiple experiments using the data, ideally perform external validation, and then publish a manuscript, and then think of ways you can integrate your model into clinical practice. My take home message today is that if there is a signal in the data, AI will find it. And I do think that AI will help automate a lot of the physician tasks in the next decade. 
Uh, it will also enable tools that were previously impossible, like I mentioned on CAPDF or our diabetes work, but be aware of the limitations. In the end, a physician that uses AI in their practice, I think will be more efficient and potentially provide better care than cardiologists that does not use AI. And I think in the end, AI will make medicine more humane. We also need to figure out how to implement these innovation in the clinical workflow. I wanna end with my special thanks to my mentor. So Dr. Jeffrey Tyson, who's highlighted here, uh, who has taught me uh, pretty much everything about AI and he's a worldwide expert in the field. But he also shared with me his passion of drinking kombucha and brewing it. And then I brew my own kombucha and I drank it with Dr. Jeffrey Olgan, who's my other mentor in San Francisco. And I continue to do so to this day with Dr. Derek So at Otto Heart Institute while working on our research projects. I've also been uh, lucky to be partnered with different labs such as RISE Lab at Berkeley, who have been of tremendous help and support to help us do cutting edge AI work. Um, I'm happy to answer all the questions. And if you wanna chat more, you can find me on Twitter or send me an email. You can also scan the QR code as well if it's easier for you. Thank you very much. Wow, thank you very much, Robert. That's actually a fantastic uh, presentation. Super up to date and uh, lots of uh, exciting new data. And, uh, but at the same time, you know, really actually provide a nice perspective because, you know, exactly as you mentioned, there's a lot of uh, uh, confusion, you know, out there in terms of what AI can and cannot do. And uh, I think we're lucky that we do actually, you know, have you with us and uh, especially, you know, when we do actually have an EPIC. And uh, so this is uh, offers a tremendous uh, opportunity for research and of course, the collaboration. And uh, there are a number of uh, questions, so maybe we can, and some of them are specific, some of them are quite uh, large. Maybe I'll start with uh, Rob Beanland's uh, question, and uh, he says a great uh, presentation. And uh, so a uh, question was uh, like uh, the STEMI-like app uh, that you <clears throat> were uh, illustrating, and uh, also the ones that uh, you know, you'd be working on. Can these things be used in the field, for example, to make decisions, you know, right? Uh, at the site uh, when, you know, uh, where the action takes place, you know, sort of uh, before the patient actually comes. To for sure, uh, for sure. So, so I think that's a, that's a great, uh, great question. I did spoke to Dr. Mir, who's I know working on, a, on in the field, STEMI diagnosis. The main limitation I'm facing currently with this is that the data is a piece of paper. Uh, so, so there's no signal data or raw data. And this is usually subpar data for, for, uh, for training AI algorithms. It's not, I'm not saying it's impossible to be done, but if you have a ECG signal of the voltages over time, it's much more rich than just a photo of those signals. Uh, keep in mind the AI algorithm doesn't know it's looking at a photo of a signal. It just sees a photo that's usually like black and white or of poor quality. So I think having a large enough data set that's of high quality is a barrier. But if you have the data, it for sure would work. And we have demonstrated, I uh, haven't shown in this presentation, but we have developed our 12 lead ECG interpretation uh, in hospital and it works as well or better in cardiologists. Right, uh, now uh, I know my patients, uh, you know, quite often when they see me, they show off their watch and with the ECG, you know, print out on them. Are the watches, uh, you know, the ECG signal from watches eventually be able to do this, you know, I was impressed with your plasmography data, yeah. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Dr. Liu, for the, this question. I, so we did work with Samsung and mm -hmm. Samsung have a more open source uh, approach of the ECG signal. So we actually validated Samsung's AFib algorithm that was published uh, last week. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, basically Samsung allows anyone to download the ECG signal and then do analysis with it. Apple is a wild garden, so you can download the interpretation of the signal, but not the actual signal. Therefore, uh -huh. you're very limited what you can do. Of course, Apple has access to the data. It, they just don't make it accessible outside of Apple. So that's a problem. So I would say if you want to design studies using wearable ECGs, look at Samsung, look at Fitbit, look at uh, Cardia, all of our um, data extraction. Not Fantastic. Apple. Yeah, well, very uh, great insight. I'm so glad <laughs> I asked the timely question. Uh, so um, Rob DeCamp uh, says, uh, ask uh, in your cath a uh, AI, uh, project uh, using quantitative uh, corneal angiography instead of a visual interpretation, would that be uh, even better? Um, you know, so. Uh, yeah, yeah. 
That's a great, that's a great question. We actually looked into it and unfortunately QCA outside of Core Labs is very rarely performed. And uh, the data on QCA suggests it's superior to visual assessment in a Core Lab setting, but outside of the Core Lab, there's been studies that basically they, they built standardized stenoses, which are computer generated vessels. And they looked at QCA readings from different brands like Philips and Siemens. And um, in those studies, they demonstrate a, again, up to 20% variability based on the software using the same stenosis. So even QCA between brands suffers from variability and is maybe is a slightly superior gold standard, but hard to get. And the way it's currently done in clinic, not a gold standard at all. Wow, okay, that's very revealing. Uh, Jim Robley had a question is that uh, for the large studies that you were doing in San Francisco, how was the consent uh, obtained? You know, how does one deal with the consent when you analyze, you know, large uh, amounts of clinical data? So, yeah, so, so Healthy Heart is the cohort we have used for diabetes. Uh, you can actually Google it and you can subscribe to the study from the comfort of your home. Uh, it's as easy as uh, creating an account and clicking us after reading consent form online and then cl clicking accept. And it's a consent form that lasts 10 years. And after 10 years, we can prompt them by emails to sign again. So it's just a accept button on the internet. It's all done remotely. We never actually meet the patients. For all the retrospective studies like Cath AI, Cath EF, it's a de-identified data um, that, uh, and basically it's retrospective. So it did not require patient consent. Okay. Just an yeah. IRB application. Yeah, that's a very important. Yeah, because uh, it's obviously a very uh, timely question. And uh, Dr. Mikulowski, uh from Telfer, uh, uh, really enjoyed your uh, presentation. And uh, I guess I asked the question, which is a uh, more philosophical, and that is that uh, you know we do uh, deal with, uh, I guess uh, you know sort of a large variety of data, especially coming from clinical sources. And uh, then uh, then we have the situation in which you know some of these uh, will probably need to be properly taught, you know, in medical training, but right now is really not, uh, you know, sort of a part of the medical training and the, hence the challenge in terms of adoption down the road and things like that. So, you know, so I guess, uh, you know, as AI evolves, uh, would there, uh, you know, I guess the question is, you know, would there be different ways we need to actually do our clinical medicine? You know, I, in fact, I had a question, uh, for example, related to heart failure, you know, right now, every heart failure doc have their own way of documenting things and some of this doing this, doing that, right? Versus I think uh, it's nice that your AMI and CAS data, you know, has some, uh, you know, formatting to it. And uh, then of course, then the other thing is, uh, you know, um, right now it's not really incorporating any kind of uh, uh, medical education at the moment. Yeah. So what do you think? Uh, on this? Right. Yeah. So uh, thank you for the, the question, Dr. Mikulowski. I think this is, it's, um, there's different levels to this question. First of all, for the, the data, the quality of the data and the interoperability, there are companies that are currently tackling this issue. One that comes to mind, there's two, there's Human API, and there's another one called Palantir. Uh, and Palantir has been used by the US uh, military to analyze text messages and calls and all that to predict like terrorist attacks. But then they pivoted to healthcare and they're currently being used by the NIH and the National Health Services in the UK. And they built an AI algorithm that can standardize the data. So you can write it however you want uh, and it will make it in a, as a different categories and it will highlight, uh, will streamline it basically. And they have shown a demo last week, you can find it on YouTube where they basically merge like 50 data sets from um, insurance claims to different hospitals, to labs that are done in a different clinic, to images, and they're able to get a centralized data set to run AI algorithms. Now, regarding how we teach medicine, I think there is a lot of the risk prediction tools that we use that are maybe not used as much in clinic, or we should put more emphasis how to implement those. And I think there's definitely a lot of opportunities if people are interested in research uh, to learn data science and how you can contribute to it, because I think the effort must come from within healthcare in order for us to, uh, to drive this. As for the legal ramifications, I think the moment you demonstrate that an AI algorithm has comparable or superior outcomes or increased access to healthcare, I think, uh, you know, legally it will be much more easier to get approval for that. Like I mentioned in the US, uh, last year we got uh, FDA approval for the stroke detection algorithms and it's currently even reimbursed. Not so only it's approved to be used, but you get paid if you use it. Yeah. Because it's uh, health patient care. Uh, 
Yeah, that's a wonderful example. One of the questions, I think, uh, maybe I'll make a final question, and uh, uh, that is at the uh, at the present time, what is the bar for you know FDA approval? Because I think that is you know sort of a good uh, standard, right? You know, around which we can really get uh, the medical uh, professionals to pay attention, right? And also the system, you know, for sure. Reimbursement, yeah. yeah. Yeah, we had to go through the FDA approval for the, the Samsung AFib algorithm approval. And we're currently, currently uh, dealing with the FDA for the diabetes algorithm as well. They basically, they have uh, a whole department that's destined to algorithms and machine learning and AI. And it's a bit different from drug development because an AI algorithm can be a living that you can always feed data back to the algorithm and train it on a weekly basis. So they set different benchmarks to how you can upgrade the algorithm without requesting FDA approval every single time, for example, the main bit oh. barrier so far, you have to design this appropriate to answer the question about validity and um, also, hello, uh, my internet connection was unstable. Uh, yeah, right. yeah, so maybe you can, uh, just uh, uh, repeat the part on the what's required for the FDA approval. Uh, I think we heard. Yeah, uh, so, so. Yeah. Yeah, in terms of yeah, what the, so so yeah, so the best way is to work yeah. with the FDA to design a study to answer the question. In general, they want uh, a vast diversity of participants, of signals, of different conditions, and then uh, you know they're going to look at other studies that have done the same thing outside of machine learning or AI, like I've mentioned for and Haynes, mm -hmm. and then they they will de determine how many patients you need and what are the benchmarks. And I would say it really varies on a case by case basis. So while for AFib, you need a very high sensitivity and specificity because there are other tools out there uh, to use as a benchmark. And if you inappropriately anticoagulate someone, um, you, you know, you can increase the risk of bleeding. Therefore, the benchmark is higher for diabetes. If we say, okay, it's going to be a pre screening test, and then you, the participant will get a blood work done to confirm diabetes. So the risk here of uh, inappropriately diagnosing someone is just a blood work, then the bench, the, the level of evidence required is lower. Right. So it's really actually, uh, you know, sort of application specific, right? Um, wow. Okay. Yeah. So this is a really fantastic, a really enjoyable and, uh, you know, cutting edge. And uh, this is uh, super exciting. And thank you so much, you know, for sharing all this uh, with us and also all your insights as well. And uh, I'm hoping that, uh, you know, this uh, represents uh, not the end of your training, but the beginning of our ongoing collaboration. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to collaborate and thank you for having me. Yeah, so uh, thanks again uh, to uh, Dr. Robert Everham for a fantastic presentation. Uh, next week, we have uh, Dr. Uh, Mark Rell uh, 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 giving rounds. So please join us then. So thank please you. join us. Yeah, so thank you so much and uh, have a wonderful day. And thanks again, Robert. Thank you. Have a wonderful day.